Excellent. Um, thank you to the organizers for the opportunity to talk today. Um, the theme of my talk is pancreatic cancer is evil and we can do something about it. So many of you know this, pancreatic cancer is the most lethal cancer. Only 8% of those diagnosed with this cancer are living five years later. Uh, this results in about 41,000 deaths per year, and this year this number is going to surpass breast cancer. Um, as many of you know, each tumor is unique. This is the same thing with pancreatic cancer. So we have to use trial and error to determine the best treatment regimen for each patient. Uh, for pancreatic cancer, this is particularly problematic because these patients only have six to 24 months to live after diagnosis. So we don't have time to try different treatments to find the best one that will work for them. They're also very sick when they present. They're at late stage, so they have a poor tolerance for drug toxicity. Um, so this is all dismal, but the point here is that this is an opportunity for us to innovate and bring new tools to solve this problem. So as physical scientists and engineers, I think we can bring tools to this problem to really understand and combat pancreatic cancer on a new level. Um, and as I said, every tumor is unique, but also every cell within that tumor is unique. And these drug-resistant minority cells are particularly pro problematic, and we have to find them and uh, eliminate them early in the course of treatment. And currently, this is not the case. So these treatment-resistant cells outgrow the tumor and cause a treatment-resistant tumor. Um, optical microscopy is a very well-suited technique to address this problem because we can use it to monitor single cell activity dynamically over time. However, there's no perfect technology, so we have to think about the limitations of microscopy as well, and it has a limited imaging depth. Um, so lucky for us, there's been a lot of progress in uh, regenerative medicine to make these tumors in a dish called tu tumor organoids. So we can take a tumor, dissociate it, and put it in a collagen matrix and grow it under the right conditions. Uh, we can mimic what's actually happening in the host in a dish that's optically accessible. So these organoids are only about 200 microns in diameter, so very well suited for nonlinear microscopy. Um, and many people have spent a lot of time painstakingly characterizing these tumor organoids across many different organs. So I'm showing here pancreatic cancer, but this has been done in other organs as well. So we know that the genetic expression, the protein expression, the cell types, um, morphologies that are found in the host tumor can then be replicated in these organoids. Um, so if you look closely at these papers, they're very well done, but they all use standard static measurements. So they're not measuring dynamically, they're not measuring on a single cell level, they're averaging everything happening throughout the whole um, system. And so a few groups I've listed here have started to look at this problem with novel optical imaging techniques. Um, and this has shown great promise. So in my lab, we're interested in actually grabbing a pancreatic cancer tumor and understanding it on a single patient level. So we have a clinical goal, which is to develop new technologies to predict the optimal treatment response for individualized patient treatment planning. So we don't have to go through this trial and error of determining the best treatment strategy. Um, so to do this, we take a sample of the pancreatic tumor. We dissociate it into organoids, into these 3D matrix. Um, and then we do optical metabolic imaging, which I'll talk about a little bit. And importantly, we're doing this on a single cell level so we can monitor dynamic changes in um, minority populations of cells that are treatment resistant and then develop technologies or drugs that can target those cells. And then hopefully in this way, we can develop better optimized treatment strategies to achieve improved survival and reduce toxicity in these patients. So as you know, you know, with any tumor, we're still developing a lot of new drugs because these tumors aren't responsive to the drugs that are currently out there. So in my mind, new drug development is equally important to this personalized treatment planning because we need to develop better drugs. And to do that, we need a high throughput technique and we need to be able to measure things in human samples before these costly clinical trials. So why metabolism? David talked about this a little bit. It's very powerful, and we can use metabolism as a bellwether of the cell, what it's going to do, and it's an early measure of response. It's much earlier than the standard measure, which is uh, tumor size. So we're exploiting um, the fluorescence intensity and lifetime of these metabolic cofactors, NADH and FAD. They naturally fluoresce, they're already in the cell, and we use nonlinear microscopy to measure their intensity, but also their lifetime. So this is 
the time that the molecule is in its excited state before it decays back down to the ground state. And this tells us about the protein binding activity of the molecules. So we get this nice decay curve that we get that at every pixel in our image, and then we can integrate that decay curve to get an intensity, which is the redox ratio. And holistically, all these things can measure the metabolic activity of the cell. And this is what I like about this measurement. It's not too specific. It's just fuzzy enough that it tells you about a sort of whole cell level metabolism. Um, we've combined these um, variables into the OMI index, which is an empirical index that we know is very sensitive to treatment response. And we do this on a single cell level using um, single cell segmentation techniques and population density modeling so we can monitor what's happening on a single cell level. Um, so today I'm going to talk about our work in mouse and human cancer. So this is a mouse data. And we see varying morphologies of pancreatic organoids, which are expected based on previous studies. We also see a lot of fibroblasts in these cultures, and that's because pancreatic tumors are highly fibrotic, and that makes it difficult to actually deliver tumor uh, treatments to these tumors. Um, and these different morphologies have different genetic expression, protein expression, and we also measure varying metabolic activity in these morphologies. Uh, so as a gold standard, we want to know how does a mouse respond to different treatments, and then we want to see if we can predict this response using organoids. So the first thing we do is a gold standard measurement, um, which you see here as a tumor volume growth curve. Um, so in parallel, we have a separate cohort of mice. We grab some of their pancreatic tumor, and then we monitor the time course of response. And so you can see concurrence between the um, tumor volume measurements, which is improved response with the drug combination, um, and the organoid response. And you see this blue line here. This is um, a JAK inhibitor. It's a targeted inhibitor. And the organoids are developing a resistance to this treatment over time. And if you look at the population density distribution, you can see that this is apparent on day one. We have two distributions. And the responsive distribution goes away. And we're left with just a resistant cell population. I also want to point out that this is a, a reduced cost, both in terms of time and in the number of mice required to resolve this treatment response over time. So if we look at the type 2 organoids, they're morphologically distinct, and they are also showing distinct response to treatment. Uh, if you look at the blue line there, that is the JAK inhibitor, and these uh, tumor organoids are responsive to that inhibitor, whereas the other ones were not. So this just shows it's important to look at this on a single cell level. Uh, so I mentioned to you that the pancreatic tumors are highly fibrotic, and we can measure drug delivery using imaging mass spectrometry. So you see there in green, that's the drug distribution into the tumor, and the JAK inhibitor gets into the tumor, but the chemotherapy does not, unless you give it in combination with the JAK inhibitor. Uh, so we looked at the response in fibroblasts to see if we could predict um, this drug delivery behavior. And it turns out that the fibroblasts exhibit similar behavior. They don't respond to gemcitabine, but they do respond to the JAK inhibitor and the, and the combination therapy. So this is just one example of how you can look at things other than just the tumor cells. You can look at stromal components and understand important things about how to treat a patient, like how the drug will be delivered to the tumor. So we're particularly interested in, in translating this uh, clinically. So we have four patients so far. These are representative organoids that have been grown from these patients. Um, and we also see the fibroblasts can grow from these patients. Um, and this is just a, a drug response um, study here where we showed that we could resolve significant changes with drug treatment in these organoids derived from primary patient samples. So these are fresh tumors that we get from the clinic. Um, and so now what we're really interested in doing is validating this, and this is ongoing. So we're taking a, a pancreatic tumor sample, and we're applying our you know, drug screen, where we dissociate this into organoids, and we measure single cell response. Um, and we give these um, you know, experimental drugs, but we also give the drugs that were prescribed to the patient. So then in parallel, the patient gets their prescribed treatment, and it actually takes them a couple months of treatment before they undergo surgery. Um, and then at this time, we can compare what we decided would happen about three days after we got the sample, so before the patient was even treated, and uh, two months after treatment in the patient. And we're using this uh, system to validate what we're doing to see if we actually predict correctly what will happen to the patient. Um, and you can imagine that this could be very powerful if validated. Uh, we could use this to optimize treatment strategies for patients so they don't have to undergo trial and error uh, determination of their optimal treatment regimen. And we could also use this to undergo um, streamlined drug development so that these um, new drugs can be tested on relevant patient samples before costly clinical trials. 
So we're very excited. My group has worked very hard on this and our collaborators as well. Um, I'd like to thank my funding sources and also, uh, I guess I've told many of you this, I'm moving this summer to the Mortgage Institute for Research at the University of Wisconsin, so update your address books. 